time, whenever be two star speakers will be our bishop, the friend two, and after that we'll have a special selection, usually by Reverend Sylvia Mickens. Amen. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. We certainly thank each of you for coming out and sharing in this worship experience. But this morning we have a very rare and important treat. The man who's speaking with us this morning is Mr. Larry K. Sally, and he's known as a master social worker. And I wonder to myself just what is a master social worker? <laughs> And he indicated to me that perhaps we had put it down wrong. I said, what do you mean? He said, there should be an apostrophe S after master. He said, I am the master's social worker. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. Brother Sally has prepared all his life for this particular occupation. He has three master's degrees, one in social work, of course, and one in public administration, and one in business administration. He was asked the question, wouldn't it have been simpler to get a doctor? And he answered, uh, if I were to have a doctorate, I probably couldn't continue social work. He said, after you get past a certain point, it becomes philosophical. He said, I wanted to get my hands dirty. I wanted to have my person involved. He has been the director of the social work and community development arm of Benedict College for the last 18 years. And in that, he has the responsibility for several community building projects. Amen. He has worked with youth and helping them learn to read. He has worked with senior citizens, helping them to be able to access all the services in the community. But most importantly, he has been a bridge connecting the students at Benedict College with the actual social work in the community. I'm just so excited about the amount of money that he's brought into the Waverly community. Most of us may remember May Waverly as the home of Saxon Home and <laughs> Gonzalez Garden and Jagger's Terrace and Allen Benedict Court. And sometimes people would look down on a project community. But because of Mr. Sally's work, under the leadership of the president of Benedict College, he has been able to do new and exciting things by empowering people. The difference between the master's social worker and an ordinary social worker, an ordinary social worker would do something for the people. They would provide services for the people. But when you work for the master, That's right. it is important to empower yeah. people. And so this morning, to share a bit of thanksgiving with us, for his life is truly a miracle in itself. And some social workers took a hand in his development. But to help us explore the idea of thanksgiving, we asked Mr. Larry K. Sally, won't you give him a hand as fast as Sylvia comes? I want to give honor to the Most High God. Amen. And then I want to give honor to Bishop Redfern, the City Light staff, to our speaker, Mr. Burns. Uh, to all of you that are here, it is truly a sweet spirit in this place this morning. Amen. I want to also give honor to my pastor who's here, Dr. Hattie Mickens, Amen. my family who came to support me. Yes, Dr. Mickens. I want to thank my brother for accompanying me on the keyboard this morning. Amen. There's truly a sweet spirit in this place. Amen. And so what I'm going to do is take two songs and put them in one. That's all right because I want to begin singing what I'm feeling Amen. in my spirit. Amen. When I look into your holiness, yeah. when I gaze into your eyes, 
When the things of this world grow strangely dim, my God, you're an awesome God. When I look into your holiness, when I gaze I certainly want to thank uh, Bishop Redfern and uh, the uh, City Light Ministry for having me to come out this morning. You know, uh, uh, it's hard to follow someone uh, uh, as eloquent as uh, the bishop. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, he uh, has an office over there uh, in our building there at Benedict College, and uh, often I get a chance to enjoy some of his humor and wit, and uh, he keeps me motivated and keeps me directed. And that's important in uh, the things that we do. You know, one of the things that he spoke about was, uh, I guess, uh, my pursuit of education, which, uh, you know, when you have a number of degrees, uh, he's right. I, I didn't want to um, uh, spend a lot of time doing research. I wanted to spend my time in the field. But I also think part of the reason that I decided to stay in school so long was I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And I guess my, my mother said, you better finish school at some point, son. <laughs> but you know, like he said, 
everything that, uh, that I've done has been in preparation for the work that we all do out in the community in and of itself. Um, I've had the, the, the pleasure of heading up a number of agencies, being a part of a number of uh, organizations and movements, you know, to try to address some of the, the, the um, ills, the problems, the things that affect all of us in all of our communities every day. And that's difficult. And none of that would be possible without the Lord's grace and uh, mercy. You know, uh, I think back to when I was a, a young man, um, a very young man, I, I think I might have been about uh, seven or eight. Um, my grandparents lived in Casey, right across the river over there. My mother's from over there. And I spent a lot of time with my grandmother. She would take me uh, to different places. She would take me to go see the pastor. She would take me to uh, her friend's house. And she always said, this is going to be my little minister. This is going to be my little minister. And, uh, you know, I, I, I enjoyed that. I, I appreciated uh, her for the things that she would say. And I kept asking myself, you know, well, gosh, why did she say that? Why did she say that? You know, I, I enjoyed the church experience. Uh, I've been a lifetime member of uh, Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church there in Casey with uh, Reverend Gregory Glenn. Maybe some of you uh, might know of, uh, of that uh, ministry there. Um, but you know, <coughs> I tell folks all the time, they say, well, Larry, what is it that you do? I tell them, I say, well, you know, I, I'm the executive director of the Benedict Allen CDC, and they keep saying, well, Larry, but what is it that you do? <laughs> And I have to think to myself, well, gosh, what is it that I do? So a lot of times I go back and I break it down to that basic element. Uh, um, I'm a social worker. And a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, he's just a bleeding heart kind of guy. You know, he's out there helping the, the, the hopeless and this kind of thing. But, you know, none of us are without hope. Amen. None of us are without hope. At Benedict College, we have about 2,300 uh, young men and women from around the country. They're here, they're under our charge, they're here as a part of uh, the educational mission of the college. Many of them uh, are at a point in their lives where they're trying to decide what they're going to do with themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, I often see them uh, uh, there at the college and I spend some time with them. And you know, part of, I guess, what has become my ministry, and uh, you know, I. I don't profess to be a minister, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express one night. <laughs> Part of my ministry is to try to help them develop that purpose and that vision. And one thing that, uh, that, that we find lacking in some of that is, you know, uh, gratitude and thanks. You know, when you're talking to young people who have the resources, the opportunities, the, 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 the um, blessings that God has bestowed upon them, and sometimes we don't know what to do with those blessings. You know, it, it, it sometimes is difficult to reach. When I went to Benedict College long years ago, I was probably one of about 50 kids that went to the college, uh, which was at that time was about 1,100 people. They had a car. You know, I was blessed. Uh, uh, my mother was, was, was good to me, and she bought me a car, so I was able to drive to school every day and ride my friends around, those kinds of things. And I was blessed. And I'll be honest, at that time, I knew I was blessed. I was thankful for the opportunity. I was thankful that I had an opportunity to go to college. It never occurred to me that I would not go. But when I see young people there, and they're struggling in their faith, they're struggling with their thoughts of what am I going to do with myself? Do I really need to be here? What is my mission in life? Oftentimes, you know, I spend my, spend my uh, afternoon sitting down with them and talking. I was with a young lady just yesterday. She's a senior at Benedict, sing, senior English major. She works over at Amazon at night. She's got a young son. Um, she's had a lot of trouble in her past. But she's focused and she's moving forward so that she can graduate in December. Amen. The Lord led her to my office. She said, technically, she's supposed to probably be working for the bishop over there. But she ended up in my office. Her professor called me and said, we need you to uh, mentor this young lady and so forth and so on. 
She says she's not sure what she wants to do. She just found out about a program that we're getting ready to operate. Mm -hmm. In my discussions with her, I found that uh, in some of her trouble, it was in high school, some of the things that kind of turn young people towards the wrong path. You know, I found that she reached out, she found her faith, and now she wants to give back to the community. She happened upon us, and I, I'm going to try to lead her towards coming to work for our agency, because she has the compassion, she has the love, she has the gratitude necessary to try to work with some of the people that we involve ourselves with. The City Light Ministry is a wonderful entity in and of itself. I remember uh, uh, long years ago, and uh, probably not that long ago, when it began, uh, how they brought uh, 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 the evangelist Tony Evans to town, the wonderful work that you all have done with the homeless, with uh, the downtrodden in our community. And you know, I often would see them you know, uh, trudging along North Main and in some of the areas there in the city. No one cared about those individuals. No one cared about that very community where Benedict College lies. We've gotten a lot of money in that community through HUD and a lot of other agencies. We built some housing and done some things. But you know, um, one thing that a, a colleague of mine, a young lady that I had employed with me some years ago, used to, used to remind me of, faith, with, faith without works is dead. And the one thing that we try to do, we try to embody at Benedict College, is works. We try to be engaged in the lives of our fellow man, in the lives of uh, uh, those uh, that we consider to be less fortunate. And I'll be honest, most of the young people that we have at Benedict College come from those very, very same homes. When I first came to Benedict College, I was sitting in the office of the president, the president, uh, Dr. David Swinton, uh, uh, is uh, the chairman of the board of the organization that I uh, head up. He had a young man in his office. He's got this open door policy. And a lot of people don't quite understand the president. You know, they disagree maybe with his policies, uh, sometimes his behavior. I had someone come to me and someone uh, prominent here in the community said, what the is wrong with uh, Dr. Swim? I said, well, you know, I said, he's like everybody else. I said, sometimes I said, I said it's hard for him to display his feelings out there. But he very, he very really cares about the, about the people in the community, about the children that come to Benedict College and the things that we do there. The young man that came to his office was from, I want to say, Minneapolis. Came from a difficult situation there. He did not have any place to go at the end of the school term. Something that people rarely know about Benedict College is we have a number of students that are homeless. We've had a lot of families that have brought their children there, dropped them off at the front gate, at the beginning of registration, good luck. Now I know no one in this room can, 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 can identify with that. And I've met a number of them. They come there, <coughs> they don't have a clue what college is, how I need to live, how I need to interact, what I need to do with my life. It's our job to take them during that process, during hopefully that four years, sometimes that five or six years. Well, That's a process. Well. <laughs> and try to help mold those young people and make them what we call at Benedict College powers for good. The young man said, well, Dr. Swain, he said, you know, I really like being here, and uh, I know that I'm behind on my bills and this kind of thing, he said, but I'm going to try to make up for it. And uh, Dr. Swain liked me, he said, yeah, okay. He said, well, go ahead and see uh, such and such. And he sent him back over to, uh, um, to uh, Housing Administration so that uh, he could, of course, uh, uh, stay on campus. But we used to keep a dorm open just about all year round because there were a lot of students that did not have a place to go. And that dormitory room that a lot of the students that we have over there take for granted. Oh, this is a terrible place and you know, it doesn't have cable TV and such and such and such and such. You know, that's the only place that a lot of young people have. That's the only place that they can call home where they can feel safe when they close their eyes at night. But Dr. Swinton, in his wisdom, said, well, look, that's part of our mission. That's part of our mission. You know, the one thing that strikes me when I go to work in the morning, 
And I keep it in mind, and uh, if you've been on the campus of uh, uh, Benedict, you'll see a small bust uh, uh, or figurine of, uh, of uh, Mrs. Uh, Bathsheba Benedict. Many people say, well, gosh, you know, Benedict College, Benedict College. Well, you know, Benedict College was founded by Ms. Bathsheba Benedict. She, uh, her husband was a part of the American Home Mission, Baptist Home Mission, there in Pawtucket, uh, Rhode Island. After her husband passed, she took $13,000 of her money that he left to her and said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, found a, a school to help free the newly freed slaves. That was in 1870. Now, what would somebody in Rhode Island think about <laughs> black folks in, uh, in South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina, is that? Hmm. But from that small, humble beginning, Benedict College has grown. It's grown its mission of service. We've, uh, we've got thousands of graduates worldwide going out there, doing the Lord's work, serving the community, and trying to be a power for good in society. About 20 years ago, Dr. Swinton, when he, uh, he came to Benedict 23 years ago exactly, uh, 20 years ago he formed the Benedict Allen CDC, which is an organization that I work with. You know. Um, when I came on board, I sat in a room with a football uh, group of strangers. They said, well, you know, are you going to help young people? Are you going to, uh, uh, we need houses and those kinds of things. I, you know, and I, you know, I felt a certain kind of way about those things. But what I felt in that room was a love for God, thankfulness that we had the opportunity to be of service, and an opportunity for growth. And over the last 20 years, that's what we've done over there. Uh, as uh, the bishop said, those, uh, those folks that are from Columbia, they can think back that far, it wasn't that long ago, can remember when Reed Street was one of the worst streets in Columbia. When I was a student, we used to run PT down Reed Street and all the way through the Waverly community. And at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, let me tell you, when you're running down someone's street in the morning, they're throwing garbage out there and using <coughs> some words that we won't use this morning. That really shapes your perspective. There was a time you could buy anything down that street. Now it's a place where everyone wants to live. It's a place where there's peace. It's a place where the house of prayer is able to spread its ministry of, of, of joy and love. All of that is due to the grace of God. And what I try to keep in mind when I'm doing all of this work is that we have to be thankful. You know, as we approach the holiday season, you know, a lot of us have an opportunity to go and sit and watch the ball game, sit around the dinner table, you know, eat some turkey. That's probably, I won't say that's the only time I eat, but that's the only time I eat some nicely roasted turkey. It's Thanksgiving. <laughs> But you know, we don't think about all the things that we have to be thankful for. You know, we've got an election coming up just next week and <clears throat> I appreciate the minister for the prayer that he offered to guide our leaders. I was on my way over here uh, waiting on the train listening to the Steve Harvey morning show. And he's a character in and of himself, but he was engaged in a conversation with a young man about the election coming up, pitting the differences between uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. You know, I won't get into uh, the whole conversation because I think it went off the railroad tracks at some point. But the one thing that, that, uh, that I got from the discussion is that we do need prayer for our leadership. We have to be thankful for where we are and uh, uh, the time that we live in. It wasn't that long ago that most of us would not have been allowed to go to college, to cast a ballot, or to be a part of this ministry. It wasn't that long ago. You know, when the pilgrims came over and the different versions of the first Thanksgiving, you know, the one thing that they said to themselves was, we're going to sit down with people that are different from us, that have maybe some different beliefs. We're gonna share this feast, and we're gonna thank God for the bounty. That's what this country is about. That's what this election should be about. That's what our mission of service should be about. It's not about the color of your skin. It's not about 
you know, rich and poor. It's about our love for God, the opportunity to serve, the opportunity to give back, and the blessings that we have. Last year, I was in uh, Colombia, South America. It's my first time going to South America. I spent a month over there on behalf of the college. I was in a state, uh, uh, the Chico region, in Quibido. I don't know if any of you all have been there. But it's a whole state of African, well, Afro-Colombians, I'll say that. They all look like the folks here in this, in this room. I'm sitting there in, in 90 degree heat, sweating, <laughs> with a fan on, in a place that probably, uh, and I'll be honest, a place that I probably never would have uh, considered myself being in a state that I'd never been in. And you know, I, I, for a moment I, I forgot about how blessed we are. And I'll tell you, I was complaining to one of the staff that was there with us. I said, you know, I said, how is it, how can you guys take this heat? I said, all you have is a fan to sleep under every night. <laughs> you know, God has a way of uh, redirecting our paths, you know? <laughs> she said, uh, uh, I, said, I, said, I, said I said, well, how do you stand it? She said, we don't have electricity at my home. <laughs> And I, you know, and I, and I was struck. I mean, I, you know, I, I was speechless. What could I say? This is a woman with a husband and four children living in something probably not as well equipped and uh, suited as this that came to work every morning for us, 6 a.m. till 6 p.m., that didn't have electricity in her home, that left her small children to come and take care of us, that was there washing our clothes by hand. And here I am complaining about air conditioning. Hmm. I told folks, I said, I'm, I guess I'm the epitome of the ugly American. <laughs> uh, matter of fact, Dr. Swinton and I spoke about that last week. He was there last month. He said, you weren't being the ugly American. Were you? I said, yes, sir, I was. <clears throat> Well, I quickly went back to, to, to my thinking and I said, you know, I've got to do something uh, for the folks there. I have a lot to be thankful for. And every time that I start to think that maybe, you know, uh, I'm doing the wrong thing or maybe uh, I should be doing something else, I remember the blessings that God has given me, that the college has bestowed upon me by giving me a degree and giving me an opportunity to be able to be of service. And I think about that young lady. I've been working over the past year to try to support their mission there. I was uh, able to connect with some of the churches there and spend some time. But I think one of the biggest things that we can do to be thankful is to show our gratitude by being of service. And that's what uh, I try to uh, do with my life. That's what Benedict inspires in his young people. That's what I try to get across to all of the folks that I come in contact with, whether they're students, whether they're clients of the agency, people out there in the community. There's always someone, my mother always said, there's always somebody that has it worse than we do, always. You know, we're driving around in a, a, a 2004 Infinity. There's somebody out there catching the bus. We're catching the bus. There's some guy out there uh, on foot trying to make it the best way he can day in and day out. So we always have something to be thankful for. And we have to thank God for the opportunities that we have. And we have to return those blessings by being of service. You know, at this time, you know, when, when, when we sit down and think about all the things I think it's important that we count our blessings and remember that uh, uh, Thanksgiving is a thank, uh, it's thanks for the gift, it's thanks for the giver. And that giver is our Lord and Savior. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to close because I know uh, many of you uh, have to go to, break, uh, uh, go to work this morning. <laughs> I've got to go over to, uh, as I call it, the Swinton Plantation. <laughs> and I jokingly say that, I jokingly say that, because like I said, it, it is a pleasure to be able to, to do the work that we do. You know, we were recently blessed with a, uh, um, 
million dollar grant from the U.S. Department of Labor. And uh, we're, thank you. Once again, another blessing. Uh, we're going to be serving about 60 young people from this area. It's a program called Youth Build that helps young people get their GEDs, develop job skills. We do a lot of life skills building with them. I'm hoping to be able to tap into the work that the ministry does here and have you all help us with those young people. I see them every day. They come by my office, but we're going to start that program in uh, uh, early January, we're trying to tool up now, we're recruiting. <clears throat> if you know of some young people, they have to be between the ages of 16 and 24 that have not completed school, and I'll be honest, we can take a few that have completed school. They have to have a couple deficiencies, maybe. Maybe it's someone whose son graduated from high school and he's still living at home with mom, you know, playing on his tablet every day, and he can't get a job. Have them call us. We'd be glad to work with them. We'd be glad to get them enrolled in, uh, in the program. We've taken young people, and one of the young people was involved with the City Light Ministry, and they were also a, a resident of Transitions. He successfully completed the program, got his GED, and is working and uh, taking care of a young family as we speak. So God is real. The work is real. But as I said, if, if you know of someone, if you're just curious, if you just want to come over and share, like I said, we would love to have you. I've got those young people for a period of about six months right there at our agency, right on Two Notch, and we're able to work with them. And we would love to have the experience and the knowledge of the people that are here in this room and a part of the ministry <coughs> to assist them. I want to thank you guys for having me this morning. Certainly want to say God bless you. And if I can be of service to you, please don't hesitate to call. Thank you. Larry, there was a question raised that I wasn't able to answer. Yes, sir. They wanted to know what the cave was for. <laughs> David Duke is running for governor. Yes, sir. We want to know what you had one K. That was it two more? Uh, well, it doesn't stand for KKK, but uh, <laughs> I have to admit that's the one thing that I try to keep to myself. Uh, my mother keeps saying, well, put your K in your name because there are other Larry Sallys out there. I oh. tell folks it stands for King, though. But right. <laughs> <laughs> Delusions of grandeur. Yes, sir. Amen. <laughs> I don't know whether this is appropriate or not, but I never want to be in a place where I, doesn't, where I do not ask Mother Mickens for a song. I don't know whether she feels up to it, but uh, I'm blessed every time she sings. It just gives me hope.
Mother, I got tears in my eyes. <laughs> and let me tell you why. Uh, some of you know that I was diagnosed with a very serious illness uh, just recently. And for the last six months, I've been walking around uh, really half dead and didn't know it. And I was all slumped over and skin had changed and just didn't know what was wrong. And went to the doctor finally. My wife had encouraged me to go, but who listened to wives, amen. <laughs> but when I got there, I felt so bad uh, that I leaned on the counter and they asked me to sign my name and I had some difficulty remembering my name. And uh, so the lady told me, well, we can't see you today. We're just too crowded, and uh, we, we just can't work you in. And I slid down the wall and sat on the floor. I just felt so bad. Because having uh, not being able to see me, I didn't know what else. I was just at the end of my line. I, and so I, I was sitting on the floor right up under that little place you sign your name, and the people were telling me to get up. I said I would if I could. Oh. And finally, I just laid all the way out on the floor. <laughs> just felt bad. And said, well, the Lord, if you're going to take me, take me now. I can't feel any worse. And so the doctor came out, and the nurses had all called him and told him what a scene I was making. <laughs> and the doctor is a friend of mine. And he came out and started kicking me. <laughs> he wasn't kicking me. He said, Ripper, get up. Stop playing. This is the doctor's office. You big. I said, Doc, I can't get up. And he took me back and saw that it was serious. And uh, they diagnosed me. And he gave me a shot. And I instantly felt better. I didn't feel good, but I felt better and was able to move. And so everyone in the church had been complaining about me because they don't want me to sing. It is an acknowledged fact that I can't sing. But I tell you this, what can wash me? <laughs> Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And I was singing that thing in it where they let me get on the program. And Mother Miggers, I'm here to tell you, you tell 80, 85, 90, 95, and 100, I'm coming. Because <laughs> I'm going to give him praise. <laughs> uh, and I, I want y'all to bear witness today. It seemed to me that she could barely get over there. And you know, we got a program. I was saying, hurry up. <laughs> but when she started giving y'all praise, it looked like something came over her. Right. And then around that third chord, glory! <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. So if any of you are under the weather and not yet underground, yeah, and you want to stay above ground, why don't you give him a little praise? Amen. Let's Amen. give her a hand. Amen. Amen.